Sean Hook's Newsmaker Saturday starts now. Thanks for joining us on Newsmaker Saturday. This week, we're going to talk about climate change. And as the debate over this issue and the possible threat rages on, we know two things for sure. The planet is warming, slightly. That is not debatable, it's a fact. But the second question, perhaps the most important one, is how big of a deal is this? Is the planet truly in peril? And how much is human activity contributing to the warming? Tonight, for the entire program, we're going to speak with former President Obama's point man on the subject, a physicist who is an expert on climate change. He's written over 200 papers on the subject. He's written a fascinating new book, Unsettled, What Climate Science Tells Us, What It Doesn't, and Why It Matters. Dr. Steve Coonan is our guest this week on Newsmaker Saturday. Great to see you. That's quite a setting behind you. Uh, thank you, John. Pleasure to be chatting with you. That's the uh, beautiful Mid-Hudson Valley behind me. God's country. Steve, thanks. Yeah. Steve, first of all, basic questions. Are we warming? Yes, the globe is warming. It's warmed by about one degree Celsius or two degrees Fahrenheit uh, since about 1900. Is that out of bounds? Are we at a temperature for the planet that is out of bounds historically for the planet? No, we have seen temperatures like this in the past, not in the recent past, but if you go back, let's say a thousand years in the medieval warm period, many people think it was about as warm then as it is today. Uh, and if you go back 125,000 years, it was probably two degrees warmer than it is today. Okay, what temperature should the planet be? I mean, we can't oh, I don't a think... thermostat on this, can we? No, no, there is, there is no ideal temperature. Uh, we can adapt to almost any temperature. The real question is, how fast is it warming? If it's warming too fast, we, and more importantly, the natural ecosystems, will have trouble adapting to a rapid warming. Steve, you mentioned the medieval warming period. This is something I think about a lot. It's a thousand years ago, obviously, predates the Industrial Revolution, and we were as warm or maybe warmer than we are now. So if we've had a natural cycle on the planet that's been warmer than we are now, why are we in a panic over this? Well, we are in a panic because we believe that humans are influencing the climate, and that influence could be enough to be causing the warming that we're seeing, all of it. And the concern is that if those influences grow as they are expected to do as we burn more fossil fuels, that the warming could become more substantial than it is today. Okay, Steve, how much effect are humans having on the warming and how big of a piece of the climate puzzle is human activity? Well, you know, that's unsettled. If you read the official reports, they will say at least half of the warming we've seen since 1950 is associated with human activities. However, that relies on a set of models which uh, one can ask some penetrating questions about. Let me say it that way. Why don't you throw one at the science there, a penetrating question. What, what well, is the key question in your mind? You know, you have to ask just how good are the models. The world uses about 25 institutions that produce about 50 models. Uh, the IPCC, the U.S., sorry, the U.N. government. Um, the International Panel on Climate Change. On climate Change, correct, which is the allegedly authoritative body from the U.N. that periodically, every seven years, assesses the science. Uh, they average the models. The models have a tremendous range among them. Some of them for example, show a sensitivity that's only one and a half degrees centigrade, the other show four and a half degrees centigrade. So the response of the climate system is uncertain by a factor of three. And maybe more importantly, the models are getting less certain, more divergent from one another less as, they become, as they become more sophisticated. Okay, Steve, I wanna get back to the models in a minute, but let's ask a couple of other basic questions. Are the ice sheets melting? Yes, we are seeing a reduction in the Greenland ice sheet. Um, if you look at the rate at which it is uh, melting over the last 30 years, it's been going up. But that rate is no different than what it was 80 years ago in 1940. And so there's a lot of natural variability in the system. OK, are ocean levels rising? Yes, they are. They've been rising for the last 20,000 years. 
Currently, they're rising at the grand rate of one foot per century. At the moment, they are rising more rapidly. They're accelerating. The, rise is, the rate of rise is increasing. But in fact, we've seen ups and downs again over the past century that really call into question just how unusual the last few decades are. Are droughts getting worse? No, there's no sense globally that droughts show any long-term trend, although there are regional trends in the Southwest, uh, in particular in the U.S., is becoming drier. On the other hand, if you look back over the past thousand years, we have seen episodes of extreme dryness when there were no human influences on the climate. Are fires getting worse? Globally, the number of fires has gone down by about 25 percent since 2003. Yes. Uh, but a lot of that is due to the reduction of people clearing forests for agriculture. Uh, the influence of climate on fires is certainly there, although one can note that in the southwest where you are, there were a lot more fires in 1900. The globe was warming since 1900, but the number of fires went down and reached a minimum around 1980 or so. Steve, so, are hurricanes and weather events getting worse? There are no detectable human influences on hurricanes over almost a century of observations. And you should understand that what I'm telling you in response to all of these questions is not my science. It's what's in the official reports. OK, let's get back to that for a minute. Why is it that the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, Panel on Climate Change, that is the vanguard, that is the gold standard. This is what we're basing all of our public policy on. You did a deep dive into the science contained within, not the summaries which we're getting in the media that are frankly massaged and oftentimes misinterpreted for all kinds of various reasons. When you look at the science, is there any agreement on what's going on out there? Well, I think there's a general sense that humans are exerting a warming influence on the climate. As we discussed, we see the average temperature of the globe going up a little bit over the last century. But beyond that, it's really difficult to put your finger on any trends that you can say, aha, that's a human influence on, for example, extreme weather. OK, we're talking about in the last hundred years, one degree of warming. Is one degree of warming worth all this angst and panic and alarm and people calling it an existential threat? This is strong language that frankly worries people Children are terrified about this whole prospect because they don't know what kind of world they're going to be living in. Is this hyperbolic language helpful? No, not at all. Uh, we need to take a sober look at the scientific certainties and uncertainties and then fold them in to discussions about risk tolerance, intergenerational equity, development versus environment. But we should not be debating what the science says and doesn't say. It's quite there in the reports. Nobody ever reads the reports. And I hope that the book that I've written, Unsettled, kind of opens up the curtain a little bit on those reports. There are citations everywhere in the book to the reports. People can go check it out for themselves when they read the book. OK, who's writing these summaries and what is the objective? Well, you know, the summaries. So let's just back up a second. There's a long game of telephone that goes on that starts with the data and the research literature. It goes into these reports every seven years. The summaries of the reports are heavily influenced, if not written by governments, as opposed to the working level scientists. Then you get to the media, the politicians, and ultimately to the public. And there's so much opportunity for mischief as information gets refined and packaged along that great game of telephone. Steve, for the true believers out there who are that we're on a uh, inexorable climb to Armageddon with our climate, for those folks, are they true believers or is there something else at play in terms of maybe trying to tax carbon, which we're already starting to do? Is there some reason why people would go down the road of, of thinking that we are headed for doomsday. What would be the point? Yeah, I think it depends who you're talking to. I think for the general public and the non-experts, uh, there's 
uh, perhaps a legitimate concern for the environment, but they only know what they've been told. Uh, when you get to the politicians, I love to quote a line from H.L. Mencken, who says that the purpose of practical politics is to keep the public alarmed by a series of hobgoblins, most of them imaginary. <laughs> So, well, and this, and this goes both ways. I mean, uh, uh, OK, so Republicans have their issues that they demagogue and Democrats do, too. But on a question this important, Steve, what is curious to me is why in science nothing is ever settled, is it? I mean, we know the Earth is round, but you're always supposed to question and you're supposed to probe. And that seems to be discouraged in the environment we're in right now. Well, you know, there are certainly some things that are settled. As you say, the earth is around, the apple will fall from the tree, uh, DNA is the blueprint of life. We, we truly understand all of those things, but it took a long time. They were unsettled for quite a while, and then eventually you do enough experiments and observations, and you say, yes, we understand that. The climate system is very different. We need precise observations over decades to see a change in the climate. It's very difficult to do. The Earth is very big, and we can't observe the oceans very well, or we, we couldn't over, until about 15 years ago. So uh, there's a lot of opportunity for um, missing information, and we're trying to look for very small changes. So it's really difficult. And um, yes, we know humans are exerting some warming influence, but beyond that, there's a lot of uncertainty in what's going on. You wrote the book, Unsettled, What Climate Science Tells Us What It Doesn't and Why It Matters. You wrote it, why? You know, I listened to the politicians talking about existential threat, climate crisis. I heard some people who should know better, like Bill Gates, some former secretaries of energy, saying the same thing. And of course, I read the reports and I knew that there wasn't support for that. So I decided I just wanted to better inform the public discussion by revealing what the reports actually said. I'm not interested in persuading anybody about one course of action or the other, but let's have everybody fully informed. Steve, there are trillions of dollars at stake in public policy decisions that we are right now about to embark on, and I suspect even more so down the line. Isn't it fair that the public at least ask, can we have a bit of certainty before we spend that kind of money? There are a lot of things we could be spending money on. Is this the right one? Well, you know, that is fundamentally a political decision that expresses values and priorities. I'm a scientist. Uh, I try to stay away from that kind of political discussion, but I do think the proper role for science is to outline what the risks and benefits are of a changing climate. Uh, and I think people can legitimately ask the question, uh, should we be pursuing the line that the present administration is proposing so fast and at such a large scale, given the uncertainties in the science, and frankly, the ineffectiveness of U.S. actions directly to affect the climate. He is the author of Unsettled, What Climate Science Tells Us and What It Doesn't and Why It Matters. Dr. Steve Coonan, physicist, is our guest on Newsmakers Saturday. We continue the discussion right after the break. What caused this kind of conversion? He was President Obama's point man on climate science. Now he's saying there's a lot of uncertainty in the science. We're back in a minute on Newsmaker Saturday. Back on Newsmaker Saturday, talking climate change with physicist Dr. Steve Coonan. Just to run you down some of his history. Director of the Center for Urban Science and Progress uh, at New York University, past professor of theoretical physics and provost at Caltech, past chief scientist for British Petroleum, where his work focused on renewable and low carbon energy technologies. He was the under science secretary in the Obama administration, serving from 2009 to 2011. He was President Obama's point man on climate. Dr. Coonan, thanks for continuing the conversation. Did you have a conversion of some sort? Because your old boss said that 97% of scientists agree the earth is warming and we're on a dangerous path and there's consensus. And you're saying, no, there's not. 
Well, let me just start by saying that that 97 percent number is bandied about by people who are ignorant of the way science works. And certainly I could forgive my old boss for that. He's not a scientist, but also that the study that produced that number has been thoroughly debunked for reasons uh, probably too complicated. I know to go a lot into about right that, now. actually. Uh, the people that they polled, only a certain amount returned the survey, and of that number, 97%. But it was kind of baked in the equation. We won't get yeah. into it. But at any rate, your boss was talking about this stuff. Did you ever pull him aside and say, Mr. President, we are we are hardly certain on this? Or did you take a deep dive after leaving the administration that led to so, where you are now? So up until I left the administration, I had been focused at BP and in the government on promoting the development and demonstration of low emission technologies. But in late 2013, early 2014, I was asked by the American Physical Society, which is the organization that represents 50,000 physicists worldwide, to have a look at their statement on climate change. They had issued a statement in 2007 about climate change that caused a lot of uproar within the society because it used the word incontrovertible. And in 2013, it was time to have a fresh look at that statement. And I was asked to convene a workshop to uh, get some of the scientific underpinnings of some new statement. And I and four other physicists sat and listened to three consensus scientists and three skeptical scientists debate for a day, presentations, discussion. It's all up on the web. There's a transcript uh, that one can, can look at. And I came away from that workshop pretty shaken, realizing that the science that had been the motivator for a lot of my work was not as solid as I had been led to believe. I wound up writing an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal um, about nine months after the workshop saying, look, here are some of the problems. And uh, while I got many supportive comments from it, many people saying, Steve, you know, you're right, but I dare not say that in public. Um, I Steve, I've heard a lot that, of I have heard that over and over from climate scientists, mm -hmm. and I have talked to several uh, who are afraid. They are afraid yeah. to express this and what it might mean at their university. Why is this? I mean, is there money at stake for, for publishing and research that you don't want to go down a road of questioning? I think if you're a younger or mid-career researcher, um, it's heresy at this point. Heresy. To, heresy to speak up and say, you know, that isn't quite right. Sometimes you see it in the papers, but then there's always a caveat in the paper saying, this may be true, but humans are still warming the globe or something like that. Uh, when you get people in private and talk, uh, they're much more frank and open about what they believe and what they don't. Steve, believe. you're you're are you maybe too young to have grandchildren, but I, I had my first a, a month ago. Congratulations. Thank you. What would you tell your grandchild about the threat right now of global warming or climate change? I would say uh, look, Ivy is her name. Um, look, Ivy, um, the world is an uncertain place. There are many things that can and will disrupt your life. Climate change is probably the least of them. Pandemics, wars, uh, other natural phenomena, hurricanes, etc., cetera, um, are much more likely to play a role in uh, disturbing your life. Do you, believe, the one, do you believe the one thing you can be sure yeah. of is that human society and human individuals are resilient and we will get through this. You will get through this with enough education and enough uh, intelligence. OK, let's talk about again about the climate models for a minute. When you did a deep dive into the climate models, did you find chaos that there was no agreement among them? And what does that tell us? And what do we do with that? Because we're basing huge public policy decisions on climate models that may be yeah. not worth the paper they're <laughs> written yeah. on. I, I mean, first of all, to be fair to the modelers, they're doing the best job that they can. But it's an extraordinarily difficult 
problem. Because human influences are small, the models must be stable, accurate to fractions of a percent. That's very difficult to do when you're tracing or chasing hundreds of millions of uh, boxes that cover the Earth at 10-minute intervals over a 1,000 years. Uh, which is what needs to be done in these models. What I hear you saying is we just don't have enough reliable data, that we don't have great climate data going back beyond 100 years. We can yeah. do ice core samples, but even that reveals that the world was, the globe was warmer at a period pre-industrial revolution. That's a pretty big deal. Yeah, well, it, it is. And, and you know, the, the paleoclimatologists are infinitely clever in finding ways to infer the climate 10,000 years back, 100,000 years back, but they're not very precise. Uh, and we only have good observations for about the last 150 years, 140 years. Can so we, and even then, they get worse as you go further back in time. When you were at the Obama administration as a science guy there for climate change, uh, we embarked on this Paris Accord, okay? And we backed out of it under the Trump administration. But the bottom line is, if the U.S. did everything to stop carbon dioxide from entering the atmosphere, that we went totally green, what would be the effect on the climate globally? Yeah, I, just one correction. The, the Paris Accord was entered into in 2015, and I had already been out of the government That's right. You'd like for a couple okay. of years. Um, but look, U.S. emissions of greenhouse gases are only 15 percent of the global total. The rest of the world is much more important, and particularly the developing world, whose emissions are increasing rapidly uh, because they need energy in order to develop. You know, 40% of the people on the globe do not have adequate energy, and fossil fuels are the most convenient and reliable way to get that. So as President Biden and Ambassador Kerry have acknowledged, even if the U.S. went to zero, it would have a minimal effect on the climate. We've got to get the rest of the world to come along if you want to have any effect on human influences. But doing that means trying to stifle emerging economies and hurting their way of life. Uh, we may be causing more famine and poverty by doing that. Yes, energy is highly correlated with GDP and quality of life. And I keep saying the fundamental question in trying to reduce emissions is who is going to pay the developing world not to emit? And I've never gotten a good answer from anybody about that. You know, Bill Gates, who's written an energy book, says, well, technology, technology will develop cheap, low emissions technologies. But that takes a long time. Right. Uh, and um, it's a slow process. Can we power this country on green energy? Um, depends what you mean by green. I think we could power the country on low emission energy. And nuclear uh, in, energy. Nuclear would be a big piece of it. Indeed, wind and solar and storage. I like to say the country could have any energy system at once as long as it's willing to pay the economic and political capital to make that happen. Uh, that That's instructive because Germany, for instance, went totally green, tried to and it's blown up in their face because they can't produce enough power and power costs are six times what they are in France that is heavy nuclear. Right, and so, you know, the Germans could put in more wind and more solar and put in nuclear. They won't go that way. They shut down the nuclear plants, as you probably know. Yes. You can put in nuclear, you could put in storage, big batteries, for example, and they could have a more reliable electricity system, but it would cost them an awful lot. And in this country, as you well know, I think most people know, we've got so many pressing problems that it seems to me chasing this ineffective um, goal of zero emissions with the speed that's being proposed uh, is a real diversion of resources. I really appreciate it. Dr. Stephen Koonin, a physicist, the author of Unsettled, What Climate Science Tells Us, What It Doesn't, and Why It Matters. And it certainly does matter. Stephen, thank you so much for spending some time with us. I'd love to have you back. Happy to chat with you. Thank you. Okay, appreciate it. Say hi to your granddaughter. I will. Ivy. Thank you, Steve. We're back in a moment on Newsmaker Saturday. We will see you next time on Newsmaker Saturday.